All right. Hello, everybody. Who's in the mood for a raucous and amazingly fun time? Yeah. Oh. All right, track one. Rob is next door. I won't be offended. <laughs> All right. So um, when we're talking about the, the title and what this is about, where the, the presentation is going to focus in this discussion is around integration as it relates to an into the organization. If you want to learn more and talk more about organizational integration, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Now, some of you might freak out thinking I'm going to have 30 slides like this. That's not the case. All right. Uh, I don't know if you can read this or see it even. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. I don't know if I have to read the whole thing. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Does anybody recognize that? What's that? Tale of Two Cities and written by Dickinson. Right, correct. I think Zach has promised a drink during happy hour to anyone who can relate why would I even put something like this up at the opening of a conversation about integrating knowledge and learning management systems into an agency. Does anybody want to take a guess? What's an interpretation even of this statement? What does it mean? Why, what was it written about? That's good, yeah, the dichotomy of things. Yes, anybody else? Shout it out. No? I, I just was thinking that was like meditative for Kelsey. Yeah. Oh, well, I what what inspired me about this concept and what was written is what is this duality of reality, right? Of of the paradox. I think that's what this is saying. It's like even a person or people that are in the same, experiencing the same situation, see it potentially drastically differently. There's uh, some people who see a new enterprise platform and say that is the best thing that could ever have happened to this organization. And there are others who say that is a load of, yeah. I hear that. I mean, I, I don't know. Has anybody experienced that with perception around your systems that you've implemented? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where um, if you're the SharePoint specialist from the IT department and you're putting out a new intranet based on SharePoint, it's probably the best thing that could ever be done. But I've heard plenty of opinions from users that say it's not meeting my needs and it's the complete opposite. So I, I draw inspire, inspiration from both that that fact that we deal with this all the time. We, we deal with it in our society. People that are, we have facts or we have situations and people can see it drastically differently. And I think that the main lesson here is that never, never assume it's, it's only one thing and everybody experiences it the same way. I think connecting that to the idea of integration is really important because if we're talking about things that get adopted within an organization, that perceptions really matter. And um, we have to listen to people and try to understand where there might be really paradoxical or, or, or different opinions, drastically different ones. So what we're going to cover today are a little bit about a story, the context of, the, of, of this stuff in the Peace Corps, where I work, um, a tale of two sites. So the idea of a, a couple of stories around two specific web platforms in the Peace Corps, and a content management system and a learning management system. And then from those two, specifically trying to draw uh, some elements out of what made a difference or what impacted this idea of integration. And so it's some lessons learned and some recommendations perhaps coming from that. And lastly, talking about this concept of windows of opportunity and when to know that you actually have one and maybe when to seize it and really don't let it go. Don't, don't let it close on you. So first off, very quickly, the Peace Corps, for those that um, may not know exactly what it is, it's a, it's a federal agency that I think is really cool. I was a Peace Corps volunteer a long time ago in Bolivia, and I had the, the pleasure of coming back and working as, uh, as a staff member now in the, in the agency here in Washington. But we are uh, all about changing lives, working overseas, 
and really working at a community level to train up uh, people and change systems, typically at the local community level. A big part of it is the delivery overseas. The other part is actually bringing it home and helping people here at, back in the United States to understand the reality of other countries as well, which I think is increasingly important in, in our world today. So I feel very privileged to work at the Peace Corps. We are working with over 7,000 volunteers at any given moment in approximately or in 58 countries uh, as of today. Um, we've got 3,000 plus staff working around supporting um, volunteers, approximately 800 or so in Washington, uh, some recruiting offices around the country, and then the rest in our country offices. And so that's a relevant part of our story. Um, learning across the Peace Corps. I don't doubt that this is probably a similar image that many of you have maybe even used or think about, right? Where if you're talking about knowledge sharing or learning, um, where it's happening, how it's happening in your organization is, at least in our experience, and this isn't just in the Peace Corps for me, this is in a lot of places, the majority of it is happening out of sight in a way, right? It's under, under the surface. That's why I like the iceberg image where so much is happening on systems that may be just randomly picked or not so randomly by your users at any given country office or in any location and they get some traction around it or they're doing a lot of self-directed, self-initiated uh, use of social media that happens. The point being so much of that is out of, uh, out of sight. It is a lot of unstructured in many ways, not, not necessarily a lot of formal things that we can control. What I want to talk about a little bit more is how we're raising a couple of systems up to the top surface, specifically this one you see learning space, um, which is our learning management system I'm going to talk a little bit about, and PC Live, which is our a content management system. And really one of the, I think the important things that's happening in this story at the Peace Corps is how we're raising shared platforms that people can utilize from a lot of different positions across uh, the world, in our case, to bring things above the surface. And so more people can actually look at each other's content, at each other's um, courses. And it becomes more a formalized part of the learning that's happening. I think the other big storyline is that the top of the heap there, for us at least, is still in-person training. We are an agency that's been around for uh, since the 19, early 1960s. And the training model hasn't largely changed. It still is in the, in the mode of, in some pockets, innovating and shifting into a digital learning approach. But we still have the, the king of the heap being the traditional in-person delivery. And that presents its benefits, but also big challenges for cost as budgets are being cut back and um, that people expect a different experience as they're coming into their work world this, uh, at this, in this age as well. So this gets to, Zach, a point that was made this morning about why we're doing these things and connecting it to the business outcome or the business, the, really where the rubber meets the road. For our organization, for the Peace Corps, a lot of this, this work and investment that is being made in knowledge and learning management is all about improving volunteer effectiveness in the field, in the countries, in the communities where they're working, and so that we're actually really, uh, for the taxpayer dollar, getting as much positive benefit as possible. And that involves also staff development and skill building, our ability to have compliance training and reporting, saving money, operational efficiencies. And so a lot of this, the systems are not just, we've learned, is not trying to have them just be the nice to have, but really connecting it to business outcomes for this agency. So a tale of two sites. So I'm going to just give a brief description. I'm happy for anybody to ask questions if you want to get any further details, either clarification now or at the end. Um, so the first story that I want to talk about, I'm going to talk, talk briefly about two sites, and then the lessons will be derived primarily from some contrast between these two. So PC Live is a content management system, primarily, that was created Probably this is the third attempt, I would say, kind of in the storyline of the Peace Corps. And I've not been a part of that. I've been at the Peace Corps for about four years. But this at effort to create a, a, a knowledge management, a content management system specifically, but to connect communities of practice, that ideal, um, 
not just among staff behind the firewall, but with volunteers and partners around the world, has been in play for the last 15 years, and at least three major attempts at doing it, each one kind of ending, leading up to PC Live, which took hold about five years ago, and was initially brought out as a SharePoint site, but was quickly taken and taken down and, and converted uh, into an open source um, platform that's built on Joomla, for those of you that are interested in that technology. And the story of PC Live is very interesting as well. We're going to, I guess I won't go into too much detail now because more of it will come out in the contrast. But this has been a real, it was a real breakthrough for the Peace Corps in the sense of having a space where volunteers, staff, and external public could gain access to and share in content. So critical manuals that are informing the way people work um, in our key sectors such as agriculture, food security, health, education can be found and located. It primarily serves as a content repository and a library and that's part of the storyline as well. The communities of practice aspect of it really has failed to take to take shape and to get to get critical traction, and therefore it's 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 part of the storyline here is why that took place and and what it really is and seizing on that. So for right now, we'll leave it at that for PC Live, just so you know where we're at. Learning Space is our learning management system. That's the name we have for it. We've had a learning management system. Um, I think it dates back to 2010, so about nine years now at the Peace Corps that they've been formally using a, a learning management system um, and using Moodle for, for most of that time, if I'm not mistaken. Just two years ago, we switched to actually relaunch the learning management system. And we've combined two systems, one that was serving staff and one that was serving volunteers, into a single system, a unified learning space for the agency, and also now opening it up to external partners so that strategic partners can actually be engaged in content and courses and, in fact, forums and knowledge sharing as well that's happening from the, the learning management system. Um, another part of the story with, with uh, learning space is that it's hosted uh, externally, so we got it outside of the Peace Corps' internal management, and we partnered with an external vendor, which I'll talk about a, a bit more. The primary purposes that it's been serving um, initially was all about just mandatory training, and so very much uh, kind of a static approach over the initial years. And what we're seeing now is really that shift in the relaunch towards something that is much more uh, diverse than just a couple of offices pushing out their mandatory training to multiple points throughout the agency using it for diverse purposes to, to, to promote learning in many, in many different ways. So that's the basic elements of the two platforms that I want to draw some of the lessons from. So I want to talk now about just what we learned that made a difference. And, and this is where I can uh, skip you know, ahead pretty quickly. And if you want to come back to anything afterwards or go deeper in discussion, we can, we can do that with, if we have the time. I think the, so I've got eight of these um, uh, elements that I wanted to highlight. And I, I think that I put this one first because I think, I, I believe it is actually the, it has been the biggest difference maker for us. One of the reasons that learning space has gone from three country offices actively using it to build courses, manage their, manage their learning uh, two years ago to 44 country offices using it today, um, which is actually out of 58 is a pretty dramatic uptick in adoption. One of the main reasons that that is happening is that the system is created and intentionally supported for them to take control at a much more localized level. I think this is the, probably the biggest contrast with PC Live, that PC Live was uh, unfortunately not actually developed and launched in a way where people at a more decentralized level could control their own content collections, to curate their content, to manage their information in the way they want, rather than just submitting something to a central library and having filters that people can filter through it, but not giving individuals at at distributed places that sense of ownership. And this is a tremendous difference maker. I would encourage every one of you to think about 
how far you can push the envelope on decentralizing control of subsites or portions of whatever type of platform you're using. It's been tremendously um, valuable to us, especially work for people to say, hey, I have a workflow, I have a, I have a process that I need to, to try to do, do it differently. Can I use this system for that? And our, our core team saying, well, let's, let's give it a try. The willingness to take a, a, take a chance, be, be, be willing to, to perhaps fail, but to do some, some experimentation with divergent uses that go beyond the sweet spot of the platform. I think that's another lesson to take away from this, is that a learning management system isn't necessarily the best at a con as a content management system. That's why we call it, I guess, a learning management system. But the fact that the agency is not finding the same value in certain and control opportunities on PC Live, they shifted a lot of folks coming into the learning space to manage content collections. And it's been a very interesting process to see. And um, we have to kind of take that path. But it has been a tremendous boon for integration and adoption by allowing some of those things to, to happen. And then to, to, to rein it in if it's getting beyond the pale of, of what's acceptable. A second element that I think is super critical and this is probably related perhaps closely to what Zach, that point about business um, outcomes, is connecting it to business processes. And if, if all you're doing, if you're launching something, whether it's a content management, learning management system, and it isn't actually giving people something that makes the core business processes more efficient in ways that uh, key people can feel it touch it, see it, and actually talk about it, then I think you're doomed for, you know, again, a kind of a backwater of, of the agency or of any enterprise. So identifying those mission-critical business processes and the business units where they care the most about making some change is um, really important. How you then work with them to see a workflow. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I guess the pictures here draw from our volunteer recruitment and selection office, which is a huge part of the Peace Corps. If you're pulling in, you know, thousands, you know, processing over 20-some 20, 20 thousand applications each year and pulling in uh, at, 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 at volume a lot of new people, you need a team of folks distributed around the country, specifically recruitment officers and campus ambassadors. And so one of the business processes, and that's a mission critical thing, especially with the new administration coming in, they want to beef up the numbers of volunteers in the field. Um, we worked with that office to improve the way they were able to train up their campus ambassadors and recruiters, the recruitment network, which is central to Peace Corps success. Moving it into learning space, into a learning management system for the first time, and allowing them to not only build curriculum within a system that is shared, but bringing um, discussion forums and other aspects that this particular platform, Moodle, allows you to do, which has really actually generated a lot of value over the last year for this particular group. And I think that the, the bottom line, I think, in that uh, recommendation I have there is, is that if you work with those critical business owners and improve one of their processes that matters to them, they are going to be your most influential champions. And there's nothing that compares to that when you're trying to make the case for funding or for not just getting gutted um, and having your system taken down or neglected. That, again, drawing a lesson back, I think that with PC Live, while we created a really valuable repository, it was most valuable for a couple of offices that produced our training manuals, less process valuable to a lot of the other places in, in around the agency, especially our field offices, our country offices, that needed to actually organize content on their own, in their own way, for their own incoming training input, they call it, right? A cohort of, of 30 or 50 new volunteers coming to the field. We work with those country offices to stand up their in-service, their pre-departure environment for incoming invitees, so they're actually getting a checklist of all their things. We actually beat out, uh, we won't name the company, but it's one of those big three corporations that had a competing product sold to another part of the agency to support the pre-departure environment for incoming volunteers, or invitees we call them. 
we actually displaced it with this learning management system, which is running at a fraction of the price just because it actually met the needs of the process in a much better way, and it integrated with then the in-service training that happened in the countries after. So you're not creating another half dozen sites that people have to log into or remember passwords to and having this whole idea of fragmentation. So a big lesson here is the more we can unify on more shared platforms and actually solve some of these core process challenges, it makes a big difference. The communication aspect is no doubt um, I think probably a very common one that everyone might talk about. It's maybe what seems most intuitive, but if anybody, has anybody seen the movie Moana? Yeah? yeah? Is, is that, a, I, I forget if that's the one where there's a scene where she's trying to get out beyond the reef and she's not supposed to, or that's a danger because there's these waves that break, right? Is that it? Yeah. And so if you've seen, if you haven't seen Moana, there are, you, you, you might remember tropical uh, be, being a part of that. You're in a calm lagoon, right? You're paddling around and um, you can see the end of that reef way out there in those big breakers where they're crashing. And I think that that challenge, you have calm water, but if you try to go out further, you get those breakers and you're either gonna get destroyed or get set back. To me, that's a lesson for communications. We did a lot of launch communications for PC Live. Great swag, um, a lot of promotional um, and a lot of integration out in, in, in events uh, early on. But we, because of certain internal changes, budgeting, different hiccups, which I'll talk about, we, we didn't have the ability to follow through when there was a need for additional communications in many different ways. And I think that that's been a difference maker for learning space so far. That we not only did the initial rollouts, some of the things you see on the screen as posters or the events, uh, but uh, more to the bottom picture with that, that gentleman who's from our uh, Georgia, the country, that's one of those power users. He's a tr you know, master trainer. He's one of those guys that started using this and his voice carries so much weight when he's talking about it and when he's starting to, to be the evangelist about the virtues of, um, in fact, I didn't include the quote, but he has this great quote where he was like, once you master and then use learning space, the possibilities are infinite. And that has been reverberating around with his peers in many countries around the world. That is 10 times more valuable or 100 times more valuable than, than us centrally pushing out messages. And I guess the other point about the Moana idea is that that doesn't just happen at the beginning and then you forget about communications and then it's live and launched. This is not some linear uh, progression, a growth. Um, there, if any, I'm sure many of you have experienced it. This is, you know, disruption, and the wave crashes, and you have to try to reconfigure the messaging or pull up new metrics as to why uh, you should exist. We had a uh, presidential change of administration that actually played a, a tremendous part of a whole change of political appointees that lead an agency like the Peace Corps, re-educating. Uh, why something matters, why you shouldn't gut things. That, that communications process is happening all the time. And I think it's a very much of a cumulative effect. And the more the voices get decentralized, the better it is. Um, so that's, that's something that I would, I would talk about. Part and parcel of getting those folks with the different voices, especially from your power users, is this notion of engaging stakeholders. And I think that being authentic in the way you engage people and not just uh, saying we're engaging you because we're pushing something out to you. Um, I'll give you a specific example of these rock stars, we call them. That, that guy that was pictured, his name is Kaha, uh, from the previous slide, and uh, he's one of these rock stars. He's, he didn't have a role that was named like an e-learning specialist or a knowledge and learning officer or anything like that, a knowledge management specialist. We don't actually have that in many, almost, I don't think any of those positions titled that way. But it's mostly people who have found the system to be really powerful for them. And it could be an administrative officer. It could be a medical officer. It could be a training manager for the volunteers. Those are what we call rock stars. And we've been building up this network. And it's very much to the presentation that was made earlier about communities of practice being purposeful and really nurturing something. And actually, the virtue now being that we, have, we can pull back our centrality, which I think is a key thing to shoot for, where the, the, the people from the central office or wherever the center of the initiative is, if you start having the voices from other 
places, this is all about decentralizing ownership, if those are the ones starting to drive the network or the community of practice, then you are well on your way to something pretty special. And I think we're, we're hitting that right now with, um, with learning space, with this rock star community. Governance, I would just, I think, again, I heard that this morning. It's one of those things that many times we don't want to we don't want to deal with because it's not necessarily something that people uh, who are funding things say, you know, I'm funding governance. But we've learned enough to know. And um, I advise anybody that if you overlook governance, you're setting yourself up for some really existential vulnerabilities. And I guess the caveat to that is that governance should be the right fit for your situation. That doesn't mean you overbuild things in a small networked organization that is used to doing things in a more ad hoc way. There are appropriate mechanisms, but I think the word governance could be a small g. That means buy-in of multiple voices that have a say in where things are headed and course corrections and not just something being pushed out and no, no way to calibrate or to course correct or to be held accountable. And so for uh, this is actually a tremendous difference between the amount of time we've spent on learning space governance or the governance around e-learning and the function of learning space and what was done when we were trying to get PC Live up and out. Um, much more running from the seat of our pants with the, the PC Live initiative, much less time spent on governance in, a tr in the true sense because there was no appetite for it. We were not getting pushed to do it from above us in fact, kind of dissuaded from it, uh, from some of the senior leadership at the time. And now we're actually finding that there's more appetite. There's a learning council taking hold at the Peace Corps, which is really at that executive of the business unit level to help set strategy, where there's going to be much more attention that our working group that we have that's been tremendous. I would encourage anybody that's doing anything like this to invest in, in the right fit of a working group with key people from not just your sole office where you're leading the initiative. Um, that's been tremendous for us. It's been a great way to, to, to bring expertise together and to make uh, the learning space initiative much more resilient, which I would just put that word out there. That's one of the big things about why we try to integrate is to be resilient. This idea of sustaining collaboration, I could have titled this one also just partners. and. The whole idea is that if you go it alone, you can, you can move something pretty quickly. Uh, that whole idea of going, going fast, go alone, go far, uh, go together, I think that's an African proverb. But it's actually super relevant, and you have choices to make. Right? Sometimes you just have to rush it and do something on your own and push it out. What we found, though, that there's been a real difference maker for this learning space initiative, that partnering with a lot of different entities. One of the most specific ones that I think has been a difference maker is the partnership uh, with our vendor who provides the support for Moodle and hosting and has just been a tremendous asset to us when we are getting beat up internally with people leaving, the whole idea of turnover, um, the whole idea of limited capacity of people that might be in the positions fixed within especially a federal government agency you kind of get locked into certain positions in some, some ways. And so the adaptability, the, the, the idea of the, the, the ability to be more agile, to be, have a deeper bench, to be more responsive, has been tremendously extended by having a reliable partner. And for some of you, that might be an internal partner. For others, it might be an external vendor. I, I think that it's a lesson that we did. We had too much over-reliance in our PC Live initiative on more of the, a single individual with extremely high talent, but we didn't necessarily nurture the uh, force multiplying effects of the other sources of, of skills and value. And that has had its knock on negative effects for the sustainability and the adoption of the PC Live platform. And I'll talk about that related to some other things in a second. This one is about the idea of, I, I, again, I think this was referenced in the morning, not just about the technology. So we've got, this is just kind of a roadmap picture where we're talking about this, make sure we're focusing on the people and the process. 
as well as the technological development. And so for this slide, I think the most important note is that with the people, we really have been focusing not just on communications, on pushing out, but on the engagement with folks around course building skills or how to use and optimize the system or specifically how to manage distance learning in a new way and not necessarily flogging the platform, but getting people to think about the integration of technology and the whole idea of working at distance, which for an agency like the Peace Corps is a tremendous culture shift for a lot of folks who are used to a, a fairly more traditional in-person delivery that I was talking about earlier. So there's been a tremendous uh, emphasis by our team on focusing on people, specifically on training, workshops, webinars, competencies that we are designing so that people can understand how they might progress as an office or as an individual. And connecting that with process documentation, which is really critical if you're wanting people to understand how does something fit with the, either their business process or how can I be an effective uh, user of a system having things that are understandable and accessible and not just in a 50-page document broken out. So we've done a lot of, of work on those top two levels, and I think that it's really helped to be more responsive um, to business units and, and adapting training to their needs. I think the other thing that I might have mentioned earlier is that on the people side of things, it's not just looking at those who might have a title of a um, knowledge and learning officer, or somebody who might traditionally fit and say, well, that's what I do and therefore I'm involved in a platform. Um, it's really that whole idea of taking down the mysticism around something, opening up the black box and having more people who just think, hey, I can do this too. And with the right amount of training and some documentation about standard operating procedures, can you get them on their way? And that's been a big part of, of the integration success for us. These elements in the integration of the user experience, and this probably speaks most to those that are interested in the technology aspects, of something that we've done well and we've done much better because of our partnership that I was mentioning with an external vendor, to be able to adapt to user needs. I think Zach uh, also mentioned earlier in the day in that early session about enhancements. This is all about that, right? This is all about working as you evolve over time. And if you recall that prior slide on the roadmap, not everything was done at once. We're kind of, we're, we're just actually coming out with podcasting feature baked into this system. We have Poodle, which is an, a plugin for Moodle that allows our language instructors to record assignments directly in their courses. Um, that's, that's a very nice function for them. We have the integration of IntelliBoard, which is great for ad hoc pulling of metrics and dashboards of, of knowing how people are using the system. And that's decentralizing so multiple people at multiple places can pull their own reports and not just the central back office who wants to have some accountability. The mobile app, which is really just coming on for us, is another feature that we keep hearing from, especially from our posts, our country offices in Africa. Uh, we have low bandwidth. This is irrelevant or not, 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 not realistic for us to use with our, with our staff, with our volunteers. Well, we're bringing forward now a mobile app and a desktop app that allow for offline in interaction with the content. And when you can have a connection back, it uploads and syncs with the system. And that is a game changer for our agency. I'm sure that there are others that have been using that uh, technology or that approach for a long time, but it's hitting these things in the right moment for us and in the best of our ability, given the conditions of, of a federal agency, to really try to reduce friction. And I think that's the main headline here. If you think of anything other than that is how can you put yourself in the user that whole idea of design, user design, user centered design, but that experience and take away the friction of day-to-day -day use. And for us, that meant as simple as single sign-on with this system into a half a dozen other systems that formerly were completely separated from each other. That makes, for many people, all the difference in the world. PC Live did not get a single sign-on set up, and really, that was one of the biggest complaints that people had to log in consistently to cross from one platform to the other. And it was a true setback at a time when it shouldn't have, have been. Um, 
but we have learned to do it differently with this particular platform, and it is really, truly making a big difference to, to, that people keep saying they want the one-stop shop, and we all know that not one single platform or technology gives you all that, but the more you can integrate and connect in a more of a friction-reduced environment, it's, it really pays off for adoption and integration. So this last part, before I close, is going to talk about some windows of opportunity and why they matter and how to seize them. So the concept is pretty simple, right? You always, you know when, you, when a door opens, um, oftentimes we don't go through it. We maybe hesitate or a window or um, we're not ready for it. And I think that that's one of the things I've learned over the last years is that windows don't stay open forever. Opportunities come and go. And if, you don't, if you're not ready to seize them, if you're not ready to be lucky, or if you're not ready to act aggressively to, to capitalize, you're missing out. And you're, you're putting your initiative at, and, at, and the whole enterprise at, really at risk, I think, of, of tremendous setbacks. One thing is when you actually have a team that has got people in, in the chairs, is working together, has chemistry. I've, I've now been at it long enough to know that that isn't a continuous state and especially with this issue of st staff turnover, um, some of the things that people have discussed, when you have it, you got to run with it. And um, that's something that I really appreciate. And I try to keep cultivating up teams that have chemistry, but I've come to really value those moments in life when I've actually, when it really was ticking. And just learn to do more when you actually have that happening. Consolidated business ownership of related platforms. This is actually a big issue. We previously uh, had a larger knowledge and learning unit prior to the change of administration um, now two years ago. PC Live and Learning Space, our LMS, we were all together in the same operating unit. And after some budget shocks and, and setbacks with the way people had to reconfigure things, things got broken apart. And so that team chemistry got disrupted. That operational ownership over core platforms got disrupted. It's, if you don't seize those moments, this comes back to when you have the opportunity to uh, actually have more oversight over related platforms or relatable platforms or systems or tools or people, you run with it as fast and as far as you can. It is much harder for us now to connect across systems when people are marching to the beat of a different drum in a different part of the, of the agency. And so I would just say that that's, that's actually something that I appreciate much more uh, this now than I did two years ago, three years ago. Shocks and pain. If you're not ready for shocks and pain, um, then you're missing a great opportunity. It doesn't sound very fun, but, and they're not. But um, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. There were some cyber attacks on federal agencies uh, a couple of years back. And because of that, there were laws and, and oversight and things like this that came down. And so the Peace Corps had to implement much more rigorous control over the use of third-party systems, different tools like Google Drive, Box, you name it, the things that people actually love to use. And so the IT leads from headquarters put the fear of God into those at our country offices to stop using all these things. Now that would have been wonderful if we were ready to absorb a lot of the displaced migrants, right? The migration of what you're stirring up from that shock. We weren't. And PC Live, for example, because I spoke about that decentralized ownership issue earlier, and it wasn't ready for that. That's all that people wanted at the country offices was a place then, where are, you where are you pointing me to that I should be reconfiguring my content? Where should I be bringing my people? And we didn't have the answer because we weren't ready functionally to do that. A system wasn't developed and capable of it at the moment where it was needed most. Now, Learning Space, as I was saying, was relaunched a year ago, if I mentioned that date. And that's really where a lot of this pain has come to our benefit of learning space because many of the countries and the leaders are saying, wow, you guys are allowing me to uh, manage my subsite, to, 
to, to do the things that I need to do, I'm going there. It's an authorized system. Uh, that's good within reason. We're seeing a lot of content management function that is trying to, to come, or content that's coming onto this, this, this learning management system that might be best placed on a system that is slightly uh, configured more for isolated objects versus course shells and these types of things. But the fact is, it's happening. And that has been a big part of how a shock happens. There's pain and being a bit opportunistic to say, let's, let's, let's run with that where we have to. Now we're trying to build back PC Live and some other systems to plug in to give people more agency authorized solutions to meet their needs. But it's a really, um, it was a real eye opener for me uh, to just this notion of being ready for this. And I think that's a, it's a great lesson. You can, you can go far by taking advantage of shocks and when people are in pain in a good way. Enthusiastic leadership. If those of you that have felt it or had it, I've heard from a few talking to you here as well. It's like when certain leaders come in and they get it, that's awesome. The risk is when they don't and they just are against what you're doing or want to gut your program, gut your budgets, don't value what you're doing. Why do you have so many people working on, on these projects, not understanding what it takes? That's when you have problems. And I think that this is related to that governance issue where you have leaders who can channel that enthusiasm and making sure that at those times they are authorizing certain mechanisms of governance that have the teeth to keep things going so that when people change, and that is a big lesson as well, don't rely on the, the one enthusiastic leader because you might look a few months later and that leader might not be there anymore. And that definitely is what happens in our context uh, with political appointees and the changes that happen there. So it's one of those things where it is a part of the constant communications and nurturing, but running fast and far when you have the, the leadership. And I think lastly is just budget. I've appreciated that uh, even more so now when we go through budget shocks and federal government, especially with some cutbacks and changes, is the money gets moved and you don't have what you thought you were having. So all these roadmaps and these nice pictures you're painting three years out, um, in many cases, they can go up in smoke. So the whole notion of just doing as much when you've got the money or have even limited money investing in the right things and not um, not coasting is something that has been really ingrained in us. We had at certain moments, and this gets into that PC Live story again, there was a certain moment when that was getting started where there was a lot of interest and enthusiasm for it and the budget was there, but that with the leadership changes pulled away. Staff was taken off the project, budgets were reduced, and so we've now been a much, a much harder opportunity to uh, keep building out the features that people want. And therefore, you get stuck in that kind of either the status quo swirl or in a downward spiral because you're not able to adjust um, because you don't have the money to do certain things. So I would just say to take advantage of those um, opportunities when you have them. I heard somebody say earlier the average of time that people spend in, a, in an organization these days or in a job or position. Um, we have a, Peace Corps has a five-year rule that was part of its creation to try to keep fresh, to not have... Uh, lifetime employment in a single agency and it's a double-edged sword you've got that rotation of people into positions but you've got people that are on average I think it's about um, goes up and down around three years of people staying in positions either leaving the agency or moving on to something else that is a tremendous challenge for knowledge retention and it's something that we continue to actually try to make the business case around. It's actually a very important thing for us from a sense of why are we investing in these platforms? Why are we investing in these efforts? We're actually seeing, and this is something where we often talk about content management systems and some of the knowledge capture there. I've got a growing appreciation from the success of learning space for through a loose sense of courses and the idea that while you have experts in place, you're building structured content, that is part of how do, you, how do we reduce the risk of the five-year rule and this re redundancy if somebody actually has put some things in place that has some structured curriculum. That's a great step forward for building on that when they leave. Does that get at the, the answer to the question? It's still a big deal for us, though. That's, 
the presentation that I have for you today.